following is a special presentation of The Lutheran Hour. special Holy Week presentation of the Lutheran Hour. I'm Mark Eicher, joined here by our speaker, Dr. Michael Ziegler. Thank you, Mark, and a blessed Holy Week to you. Now, to you, the listener, whether you're new to the Lutheran Hour or you've been with us for years, I invite you to continue listening to our regular weekly program leading up to Easter and beyond. You can find us on your local station or listen online at lutheranhour.org or download our mobile app, or look for us wherever podcasts are found. Holy Week is a time of year when Christians focus on the last hours leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. On the Thursday of that week, after Jesus shared his Passover meal with his disciples, one of them betrayed him, one denied him, all the others deserted him. Jesus alone has been faithful And on that Friday, he continues his mission alone. Christians have come to call this Good Friday, even though there seems to be nothing good about it. Jesus has been abandoned by his friends and will be discarded by everyone else. Even God, his Father, will forsake him. And still we call this Good Friday because of what God was doing through Jesus in all these things. God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit were there taking this evil and overturning it for good. Jesus, the Son of God, suffered the hell we deserve. He died our death but was raised to life so that by faith we can have what only He could earn, eternal life and favor with God His Father. This hymn we're hearing first written almost a thousand years ago and translated into several languages since then, speaks of that suffering Christ endured, suffering all for sinner's gain. Here is O Sacred Head Now Wounded, performed by Aaron Bodie and the Aaron Bodie Group. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sin.
You're listening to a special presentation of the Lutheran Hour. That was the Aaron Bodie Group. I'm Mark Eicher, joined by our speaker, Dr. Michael Ziegler. In these special programs, we're listening to the account of the last hours of Jesus' mortal life, as recorded by one of his ancient biographers, a man named Matthew. Matthew was one of the original followers of Jesus, and his account of Jesus complements the other three canonical gospels, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew relays the events in a unique way. How so? Well, when Matthew tells the story, he especially puts two perspectives in conflict. So there's the perspective of those who oppose Jesus, and then there's the perspective of those who would come to follow him after they saw him bodily raised from the dead. So people who study Matthew's gospel often notice him using a literary device that is called irony. And how do they define irony? It's not irony in the sense of sarcasm or something disappointing happening. According to one New Testament scholar, a man named Jeff Gibbs, he says that irony involves three things in Matthew's gospel. First, there's the presence of two perspectives on the same set of events. Second, there is a tension or a contradiction between the two perspectives. And third, one of those perspectives doesn't understand what's really happening. Could you give us an example? Sure. An example of this is Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. It's when the people in Jerusalem say, referring to Jesus, to Pontius Pilate, his blood be on us and our children. Two conflicting ways to understand that statement. The crowd means to say, we take responsibility for killing Jesus. His blood be on us. But Jesus has already said that he is willingly pouring out his blood for many, for the very people who are crucifying him for the forgiveness of their sins. So in this sense, the people's words are ironic in that they are speaking more profound truth than they can fathom at this point. What's Matthew's purpose in putting the two perspectives into conflict like this? Well, first we should say that his purpose is not to distort the facts of history of what actually happened. Matthew is writing history. It's a report of actual events At the same time, he's relaying the events in a compelling manner, in a persuasive manner, and he's employing irony to make his point in a way that a more straightforward report couldn't do. So he puts the two perspectives side by side in conflict in a way that rules out a third perspective, a neutral point of view. So Matthew's narrative is designed to galvanize us as listeners, to ask us implicitly, what about you? Where do you stand with Jesus? Do you stand against him as an opponent or do you bow before him as a worshiper, as a follower? So Matthew won't let us be in the middle and say Jesus is just a good teacher or a a wise sage. So I invite you into this story with us. Listen for yourself. See how Jesus strikes you. Then, when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. 
and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was forming, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews! <laughs> and they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. <laughs> he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli! Eli! Sabachthani! That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is Calling Elijah? And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs. 
After his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. <clears throat> Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers. Go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed in this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christian author C.S. Lewis said it well in his book titled Mere Christianity. Lewis said that 
we should help prevent people from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. That is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else the devil of hell. Again, there's no neutrality with Jesus. Lewis says, either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I appreciate you sharing that. And you said that was a quote from the book, Mere Christianity? That's right. It's in the second part of the book from the chapter titled, The Shocking Alternative. And uh, shocking because it's uncompromising, which could make us feel uncomfortable. It is an uncompromising claim. It seemed to make the first disciples of Jesus uncomfortable and doubtful at first. When Jesus meets the disciples in Galilee, as he promised, and they see that he really is risen from the dead, just as he said, they worship him. They honor him as the Lord, as true God and true man in one person. But then Matthew tells us that some of them doubted. And it's to them that Jesus makes the final promise. He says that he's going to be with them always to the end of the age as they go out making new disciples in his name, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to guard and observe all that he has commanded. It's to the doubters that Jesus makes the promise. Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Amen. And Jesus promises that to us, to you, always, even through your doubts. Matthew's message from beginning to end is that it is only by God's grace in Jesus, only through hearing God's word and the power of God's spirit that any of us can truly call him Lord and do his will. God's spirit, God's word, they're still here for you today. They are active in you. And we welcome you to join us in giving praise to him through the words of this beloved hymn by Isaac Watts, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, performed by the Aaron Bodie Group. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss And pour contempt on all my pride Forbid it, Lord, that so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And with those words on our hearts, we turn now to God in prayer, asking him to protect and defend his people around the world. Almighty God, since you have revealed your glory in Jesus, your word of truth, protect your church, spread throughout the nations, defend us against the devil, so that we may serve you in faith through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And we pray for those who are outside the church and for those who have forsaken the weekly gathering to hear God's word. Holy Father, because you seek not the death, but the life of all, rescue those who do not yet know you. Restore those who have wandered from the voice of their shepherd. Bring them into the fellowship of your church through Jesus Christ. Amen. And finally, we pray for our enemies, even as our Lord prayed for those who crucified him. Lord Jesus, you commanded us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us. Let your love for all people move us to do good to those who seek to harm us. Send them your Holy Spirit so that they may come to fear and love and trust in you alone. Because you have conquered sin and death and you reign with the Father and the same Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You've been listening to a special presentation of The Lutheran Hour. If you only heard part of the program or you'd like to share it or listen again, you can find us on the Lutheran Hour mobile app or search for us wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us and our global ministries, visit lhm.org. The scripture quotations are from the English Standard Version of the Bible, copyright 2001 by Crossway, a publishing ministry of good news publishers, used by permission, all rights reserved. We'd like to thank all those whose music made this program possible, including the Aaron Bodie Group, featuring Marcus Grillo on guitar and bass, audio mixed by Chris Hobson. We'd also like to thank Dr. Jason Brogy, Dean Evans, Christy Bond, Sharman Birschbacher, Jim Arend, John Christopher, Megan Murley, Jeremy Knapp, John Spangler, Chris Mackey, and Dr. Michael Ziegler. I'm Mark Eicher. On behalf of Lutheran Hour Ministries, a blessed Holy Week to you.